started. If you are walking around the pier, you are welcome to join us. This is a free public event. If you're a tourist visiting from out of Santa Monica, please come and join us. This is a one hour long program. You can stay as long as you want, leave whenever you want. But this is so good, you won't want to leave. Uh, tonight we are hosting the fourth of a four part debate series sponsored by the Arthur N. Roop Foundation. Tonight's topic is about the housing crisis in Los Angeles. We're going to be talking about gentrification, densification, transportation, and why the rent is too damn high. Part of what we're doing tonight is modeling civil discourse. This is not a typical debate where people are nasty to one another. This is a kind of debate where you actually learn something about the other side and how they think and why they think that way. So for that purpose, we brought together a really, really impressive panel of guests who are going to share their insights about housing in LA. I'm here representing ProCon.org. We are one of three primary partners to put on this debate. ProCon.org is primarily an online organization that looks at pros and cons of controversial issues. So if you don't know what to think about minimum wage, medical marijuana, teacher tenure, gun control, you go to ProCon, you read both sides, you walk away with a more informed perspective. We have a booth in the back. At the booth is Kate, Tracy, hello. We have our timekeeper for the night, Jeff is here. Camera person, Natalie. I think Clint is around here as well. Our staff is all here. We're giving away swag. If you want free shirts, free bags, free movies, free bookmarks, help yourself. Please, we don't want to go home with this stuff. <laughs> if you tweet about tonight's event, we're using the hashtag civil discourse. We want to own that hashtag because that's what this is all about. We also have a vote on the side here. That's where you can say whether you are for or against the primary question we'll be asking tonight. That question is, is significantly more development needed in Los Angeles to help solve our housing crisis? If you're a pro, you can take a pro sticker, put it on the pro side. If you're con, take a con sticker, put it on the con side. And you can write the level of your intensity. 10, I'm strongly pro, or 10, 1, I'm barely pro. Put it up there, we'll do it before, we'll do it after. We'll see if any of this changed your mind. We've done this now for going on our fourth week, and every week it shifts. So we're real eager to see what kind of impact this discussion has. So that said, I wanted to acknowledge our two partners for this. So I mentioned ProCon.org. Santa Monica Pier, obviously, is another partner. We thank the Pier so much for their infrastructure. Guys, we had a great series, didn't we? And we're going to hopefully do this again next year. Our, yes, they deserve it. The, other partner is the USC Unruh Institute of Politics. So we're here on Monday nights. Tuesday nights, we're at USC. It's also free, open to the public, come and join us. By the way, folks, if you're just arriving, come and sit down. This is a free public event. You're welcome to join. So to introduce our moderator tonight, we've asked one of our, our partners from USC. This is Ms. Erica Maldonado. She's the programs director from the USC's Unruh Institute of Politics. I turn the mic over to her. Folks, enjoy your evening. Thank you all again so much for making it out today. I mean, you can't beat this view. Uh, we're, th again, so thrilled to be here, to be partnering with Procon.org. And I have the privilege of introducing our moderator for today. And our professor, Dana Cuff, is a professor of architecture, urban design, and urban planning at UCLA. She's a director of the incredible urban design think tank at UCLA called City Lab. And she has published and lectured extensively on LA's architectural history, affordable housing, the architectural profession, and modern American cities. So without further ado, I will pass off the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is that on? It's great. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, especially to be acting as moderator. I can't think of a more important challenge for us all today, which is to think about complicated and controversial issues in ways that we disagree uh, in a productive manner and think carefully about the choices that we make, whichever direction we lean. Um, as Erica said, I'm director of City Lab, and I've been involved with housing issues for 
uh, oh, 20 or 30 years and recently wrote state housing policy that was signed into law by the governor about secondary units. And I think the hardest thing about my job tonight is not to express my own opinions, but to try to get these two to really disagree so that we can flesh out the good arguments, let them battle it out, and then you can ask some really interesting questions at the end of it, uh, and we will definitely leave time for that. Um, I want to just start out by laying out some of the issues about the housing crisis, densification, and gentrification. So, in the history of Los Angeles, we've either been in a boom time or a housing crisis. That is the nature of our history here. And I think at the same time, you can see that we've built a very particular kind of housing landscape. Our DNA is the single family house. And probably no other city uh, in the United States of such proportions as ours is so dependent and so dedicated to the little suburban tract house. We grew up in them, we think of them as the American dream, we idealize them, and now we can't afford them. And in fact, uh, even if we could afford it, we can't get to it after work because it's so much congestion that uh, the traffic has made it so that our suburban ideals seem to have disappeared before our very eyes. And in the recent debates, uh, some of which our guests here have been active participants in, there seems to be an extreme choice between the suburban landscape of single-family houses and Manhattan. And I think that uh, one of the things we could all agree upon is that those kind of uh, summary and extreme uh, positions aren't as relevant as some of the more nuanced and complicated aspects of this crisis. So I would also say that the no growth, pro growth dichotomy isn't really very descriptive anymore. Most people are not either all pro growth or all no growth. That may be exactly because we're really reaching a kind of tipping point in the housing crisis in general, where just like after the depression, when one-third of the population was ill-clothed, ill-housed, and ill-fed, we think now that really the housing crisis is affecting us all. If not ourselves, it's our children who are trying to move back into town. It's our friends who uh, now need to find a tenant to live with them so that they can afford the mortgage that they've had to borrow out of their house to um, pay for some college tuition or something like that. I want to give you some data, and then I'm going to be quiet and let our um, speakers really chime in, that shows you how dramatic our situation right here in Los Angeles is. By some measures, we have the most unaffordable city in the United States, and that's more so than New York, because our wages are lower and our rent is higher. So the gap is greater than any other city in the United States. And really, it's that effective unaffordability, not the absolute value of the rent, that's killing us. We have 900,000 households in LA County that are deemed precarious. And that means they either live in substandard dwellings, they're doubled up, or they pay 50% or more of their income to rent. The old measure for the percent of rent you were supposed to pay was 20%. We've pushed that up to 30% and then 40%, but I think we'd all agree 50% is really not doable. Um, the medium price per month rent for a one bedroom is, do I see any hands? Yes, exactly, $2,000, $1,995. Well, not so many people can afford that either, and that's a one bedroom. So Garcetti and our other uh, leaders in the city have come up with a number of different ideas and we're going to hear about some of those from our speakers tonight. Uh, should it be a new and higher linkage fee between construction so that anyone who builds a new unit of housing pays into a fund to pay for affordable housing? Should it be that we put real caps on rent increases and make stricter rent control? We are sitting in a city who's tried more of these strategies probably than any other in our region. Oh, I have zero minutes left. That's not much time. Uh, 
I will leave that uh, further elaboration of strategies to discussion from here on out and just give you a quick introduction to, our, to both our speakers and then we'll let them each speak for three minutes and lay out their own positions on these issues. Our first uh, speaker tonight is Gary Tobin. He's president and CEO of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he's a proponent of housing development, um, former board chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce executives. He'll speak for three minutes and then we'll hear from Jill Stewart on my right former managing editor of LA Weekly, which we all see uh, in the newsstands across the city, campaign manager for the Yes on S Neighborhood Integrity Initiative, where I first met Jill on another panel. Um, that was the 2016 ballot measure about growth in the city. And she's current executive director of the Coalition to Preserve Los Angeles. So Gary, would you take it away? Well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and talk about something that's pretty near and dear to many people's hearts, and that's your home. Wherever you live, whether you own it or whether you rent. And someone built the home that you live in right now, whether it's single family or whether it's an apartment. And at some point they invested in that property and and created a home that you now use. For the last 30 years, Los Angeles has been building half as many homes as we need. And all of you, when you took either high school or college economics, you understand that when you don't build enough of something, what happens is that the price goes up. There's a lot of reasons why we haven't built enough homes, and that, that is my premise, that we have not built enough housing, that we have not done the innovative things that Dana just talked about, which is creating a second unit on the existing lots, sometimes we call that granny flats. We haven't built enough really small units because at one point, city regulation said well that's too small you can't do that there has to be a certain amenities but a number of years ago many communities like los angeles made a decision that they didn't want what dana talked about earlier and that is suburban single family homes that that was going to create too much sprawl and she's right, that's what Los Angeles was built on. But then Smart Growth said, no, that creates small, small sprawl, people have to drive too far, too hard on the environment. And so let's do what's called infill development. And infill development is taking land that's already within the urban core and saying, let's create a use for that property that creates additional value for the property that creates additional housing on the property and that is where we are today in most places in los angeles if in fact we want to build additional housing it needs to be on property that probably already has housing or in some cases like downtown it may be property that was one time manufacturing property or warehouse property and now it's going to be converted to, uh, to residential housing. Prices have gone up significantly in part because there just is not enough, enough supply. There's more risk associated today. The number of rules and regulations means that the average housing project takes four or five years to get entitled to get the permission to actually build the project. So the result is an imbalance between supply and demand and that's why I think we have to find a way for builders to build additional housing for the citizens of Los Angeles. Can you hear me? 
Jill Stewart. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me all the way in the back? Okay. Um, I not really. No, I think it's a little high. Is that better? Okay. Um, I turned it up a little. Uh, thank you very much. I I think that I'm going to disagree with several of the fundamentals that Gary uh, laid out here. Uh, one of the things that Gail Goldberg, who used to be the planning uh, director of Los Angeles, said when she first got to Los Angeles from San Diego, and she was brought in to sort of clean up a, a really convoluted system of planning and development and housing development, and she said, you know, there aren't that many cities in the country like Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, in most cities, the value of the land is based on what the zoning is. The developers know how much they can build and they pay that much for the land. In Los Angeles, the zoning is whatever the developer can talk the Los Angeles City Council into changing it to. And this has set off tremendous land speculation in Los Angeles because they're all trying to game the land and make as much as they can off the land. And if you can add a much bigger building, you will pay a lot more for that land. So recently, um, CBRE, and that stands for Coldwell Banker Real Estate, and they're a very big deal in Los Angeles. And they did an internal report on what is causing the incredible prices in Los Angeles, and they didn't go to the supply and demand issue immediately. Their two top issues were uh, the incredible price of the driven up cost of the land because of speculation and land flipping. That was number one. Number two was the incredible cost in Southern California of construction. They didn't blame, uh, they didn't blame the California Environmental Quality Act, which a lot of people blame, which is, not to, which is really not to blame with what's going on. But they blamed a, a broken system, a system in which uh, we have basically, I'm not going to call them corrupt, but I know the Los Angeles City Council members well, and some of them not so well. And they are all taking huge amounts of money from two groups that you're going to see more and more of in Los Angeles. Developers from all kinds of places around the world who are playing a global investment game and do not give a damn about building housing that can be afforded by people. That's the number one group. Number two is Digital Billboard. Uh, huge, huge global companies who want and are about to be approved for digital billboards throughout Los Angeles, including in neighborhoods. Now, are, is this good planning? Is this, is, this, is this a good way to fix a problem? My uh, basic philosophy is first, it's something that doctors used to say, first, do no harm. Don't approve a major zone change that leads to either gentrification of a neighborhood that's cheap right now, which is what the city is doing in Boyle Heights. They're changing the zoning, they're encouraging gentrification, and pretty soon Boyle Heights is not gonna be affordable for middle class and low income Latino families who have been there for 80 years or 90 years. Um, that's, that's bad planning and I think it's stupid and I think the city council is causing a lot of it. I have zero time left. Um, I, I respect what Gary thinks, but I think pol politicians should not be meddling so much in the housing market. Right, so we have some gauntlets laid down. Um, I guess, Gary, I'd like to start by asking you if you think that what we need to do is incentivize housing, and we're going to do that in a way that isn't corrupt uh, or isn't changing the zoning, what would be, the, what would be a, the best means or some of the means to incentivize the kind of housing that we need, affordable housing? To create more affordable housing, you have to find a way to build more units with less money. One of the ways that you build more units is by going up. And any of you who have traveled around the world know that that is the solution in most urban areas around the world, and that is that you have to go up. Because there's there's some efficiencies of scale when you go up, you take that land price that is oftentimes high and you spread it over more units and so in fact you can build house housing that is more affordable. That's. Let me just uh, take that up a little bit with you, Jill. Let's say that's right. Let's say that in fact 
going up is the only way to go. We've run out of land. Uh, we're going to allow. We're not going to pull up the ladder now that we're all here. We're going to allow new people to move in. I think it's not like we can shut the doors and say, "You go find another city." Could be our own children, relatives who want to come. So, if we do need to build up, where would we do it? You know, we've had a discussion about this a lot inside my uh, nonprofit, the Coalition to Preserve LA. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we talk a lot about how Los Angeles isn't actually a city with a wall around it. We've got dozens and dozens of suburbs. There's 83 cities in LA County. And eventually everybody's going to be building five stories instead of three stories and two stories. Uh, a really interesting urban planner I spoke to about this said that Barcelona is one of the most fantastic cities in the world and also one of the most dense. And it's almost all four and five story buildings. They're not, they're not into skyscrapers. And one of the reasons that um, some cities don't like skyscrapers is there's no skyscraper based city in the world that's affordable. Going up, even though it's efficiencies of scale and so on, is unbelievably expensive and you can't afford to live in the high rise. Uh, it's very, very, very costly living. Uh, it's not efficient and It's not efficient and, and there are other ways. I think you're going to see a kind of a middle ground density in areas. Um, I also think that you're going to see a lot more people working at home. So the idea of a big central core with a lot of skyscrapers, I think we're going to look back on this period right now of giant, big, huge skyscraper urban central cores as a big error in our, in our time period as people because we're going to be working at home, we're going to have different forms of transportation. And the stupidest thing probably we'll ever think of doing again is all trying to get downtown, whatever city it is, at the same time in the morning. We'll, we'll think, what the hell were we thinking in about 15 years? I think so. So I think mid-rise high density is a solution that we see, in fact, just two blocks from here. You know, Santa Monica has really put just what you're talking about into motion. And, you know, it, I think it, a lot of people think that is a pretty good uh, alternative to skyscrapers, for example, which uh, is certainly not the only solution to higher densities. I wonder if we might talk a little further then about, say, if we go to higher densities, whether it's mid-rise or low-rise, high density or high-rise, how do you see the transit that we're now watching rolling out all across Los Angeles affecting that? Because, of course, as you said, Gary, one of the problems with sprawl was all of that uh, petroleum we had to use to get uh, to our houses and the then environmental problems that we caused as a result. So, uh, and a lot of people have turned to mid-rise high density as a means to get to better environmental solutions as well. What do you think about the transit that's happening in Los Angeles now? How should we be thinking about housing in relationship to transit? How do we get more affordable housing around transit? Well, we believe that transit is a part of the part of the solution, and we're strong proponents of Measure M, which passed last year, and Measure R, which passed eight years ago, and we're strong proponents of transit-oriented development, which means that you build uh, housing along the transit lines and near the stations, so that people have the opportunity to take transit to work, take transit to play, and don't have to own a car. We are building a city of Los Angeles, not for those of us who are sitting here tonight. We're building a Los Angeles for a whole bunch of young people who hope that they will be able to live in Los Angeles and not have to own a car. And that's the city I'm looking forward to helping build because it is an exciting city. Yes, it's different from what we have right now. But there are young people that go out of college to Chicago and New York and they don't own a car. And when you look at the buildings and the housing in Chicago and New York City, you see much higher density housing than we've ever built here. And it's been part of the economic vitality of those two great cities. Well, um, I would like to respond to that. Um, all due respect to your, your fandomship of Metro, 
I think Metro is the most poorly run, richest government organization in California. Uh, they have added zero additional people after spending all of our $5 billion ever since I got to Los Angeles and became a reporter. Zero additional people have been added to the trains and the buses. Not one additional person. We're at the 1980 levels in ridership. Uh, what's, the, what's the definition of insanity? You keep doing the same thing again and again and expecting a new result. The, the problem, I, there are a couple problems with Metro. One is they, uh, they are building almost exclusively luxury housing at the stops and they're starving the bus system. The bus system is the thing that working class people use. It goes everywhere. It goes to their jobs. The metro system, uh, the young people who want to stop using their cars are going to be 45 years old before the metro system kicks in at a level that it were being described. So I think that metro's obsession with luxury housing, their giveaways of their own private property for luxury housing has backfired terribly. And I don't think they're going to learn that lesson. They're pig-headed people, partly because the board is run by, I hate to bring it up again, but elected officials run the board. And they take money from developers. And the developers want to build luxury housing. Now, I finally figured out the other day, why do developers want to build luxury housing next to the stops? Because they know their people are all going to be driving a Mercedes-Benz or a Tesla. They know these people who pay $4,000 for rent aren't going to use the line. And I realized the other day, it's because you can, it's an amenity. It's like saying that there's a pool. It comes with the pool and it comes with a st uh, transit stop. You never use the pool, right? Nobody ever uses those pool. Nobody's using those transit stops. It's the same, I think it's the same thing. Just give me a chance in front of the Metro board and I'll change their minds. So Jill, I don't want you to mince words anymore, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if there's a way, and I'm just going to put it back to you for a moment, to say, let's imagine a thought experiment that at the transit stops we could actually get affordable housing, not luxury housing, and we put it in towers. Would you be opposed to that? Are you pro-affordable housing or are you against development in general? You know, that's a great question. I got a call from a guy named Michael Burnick when I first got involved in this advocacy uh, around uh, better planning in Los Angeles. And he used to be the uh, economic development director for Governor Gray Davis. And he remembered me from the era when I covered uh, the, Arnold, the Arnold Schwarzenegger era in Sacramento. And he called to say, you know, Jill, the thing is about Los Angeles, uh, you better watch those uh, um, luxury housing projects going in at the stops because I was on the board of the BART, he explained to me, when it was kind of younger and newer. And the whole idea was transit villages. And transit villages are working people, working class people, shops, maybe a few rich people here and there, but it's mostly aimed at the actual riders. And the transit village, they wrote books about it. They wrote books about what a transit village is. And that was thrown out with the bathwater um, in Los Angeles. They never built transit villages. They went straight to the really expensive stuff. If you can build, if you can find a way, and I don't know what that way would be, but you could have used all, that, all of that metro land to defray the cost, and they, they blew it. Um, but if you could find a way to build affordable housing right by the transit stops, then that would be an ideal place to put some high-rise and some mid-rise transit villages. But I, think, I, believe the, I believe it's a bit too late. Thanks. Uh, I want to turn it back to Gary then and say, you, you responded about the housing question really with a kind of supply side solution. Let's build more housing and then that's what we need is more housing and maybe in the end that'll cause greater affordability. I wonder, since we've had a pretty big supply lately, uh, I was having a conversation earlier talking about a fact there's a soft market for the housing that's being built downtown and rents will flatten out a little bit, but not a lot. I mean, now we actually are not producing the kind of housing we need. How do we incentivize truly affordable housing? In order to incentivize affordable housing, you have to do some things that help cut costs of the construction of housing. One of those things you can do is make it not take four or five or six years to do it because that just costs more. Uh, another is that you can allow housing developers to 
use um, less parking on their structures because parking is very expensive to uh, to pay for. Um, we were at a hearing not long ago at City Hall and one of the city council members was talking about the fees, the cost that the city imposes upon projects, you know, planning fees and uh, municipal light water fees and park fees and various other fees. It got to $65,000 per unit. Now, where I grew up in Nebraska, you can build a unit for $65,000. But that's what we're charging here by the city, all the fees that, that we have. And it's just too expensive. And all the, all the solutions that, that government has proposed actually make it more expensive rather than, rather than less expensive. What would you say uh, to the other kind of solution, which is to preserve all the affordable units that we have now? So, and this kind of goes to your question about gentrification also. Um, in some ways, the worst part of gentrification isn't that neighborhoods get better, it's that people have to move out. It's the displacement component of gentrification that is uh, the real negative aspect of it. Would you think that there would be a pro-growth, pro-development position that would support leaving people in place and, and uh, making sure that displacement does not happen with some kind of rent control or rent stabilization or rent cap? In other words, if you've been in your house for a certain length of time, your rent couldn't go up. We have, we have not opposed the rent controls that are in place. Uh, and we think it's also a good, a good idea to buy some of those rent controlled units and continue to have them as rent control. But gentrification is not a recent issue. It is an issue that's been around for a long time. And in some cases, you're actually taking good housing. In other cases, you are replacing one or two housing units with maybe 15 or 20 or 30 housing units and making it possible for there to be more housing in the same in the same area and we think that that is a real opportunity many of the places that where housing is being built right now that there's conflict over there was never any housing there there were actually warehouses and industrial buildings there and that's where the housing is being built and it's not taking any new housing downtown, or it's not taking away any old house. Downtown, the housing is being built on parking lots. Not one house is being replaced. They're using parking lots that used to be empty 18 hours a day, and they're building housing on those, on those surface lots. Uh, Jill, do you have anything to add about displacement? <laughs> I do. Um, you know, I'm not the, surprised. The, um, the mayor got a report from the housing department in November of 2015. His housing department, it's a great report. I've read it like, I must be crazy because I read housing reports at night. But um, it said, it warned the mayor, and it said, uh, we are losing thousands and thousands and thousands. And, and right now it's at about 21 or 22,000. Uh, rent stabilized units since the year 2000. That's a huge number of rent stabilized units. A little bit to demolition, but more often to conversion. Conversion to expensive condos, even to luxury hotels, which is a little bit dicey, uh, legally speaking. So there's really, uh, when I was a young journalist at the LA Times, I covered affordable housing. And in those days, the big issue was um, rehab. Make sure that you don't lose your older units because they're inexpensive and they're going to stay inexpensive and new units are almost never um, uh, uh, inex inexpensive. But rehab went the way of, I don't know, the dinosaurs and very little rehab is being backed. There, you see almost no rehab being discussed in Sacramento. Nobody gets campaign contributions for promoting rehab. 
But rehab of buildings is a crucial, it, it needs to be a crucial part of what we do. You save the existing buildings. Right now, if you don't know about it, the HHH money, which everybody voted for, the homeless money, uh, they haven't built a single unit, and that we, we, we approved that in November of last year. It's going to be a year. Not one unit has been built or opened. And the average price of a homeless unit, a, a unit for a homeless person in Los Angeles, is going to be between three hundred and four hundred four hundred fifty thousand dollars which you can buy a, a bad condo for out in the valley i know because i'm looking so the, the costs are insane and part, i mean it, it's there's a lot of stuff there's a, a very strong labor union crowd in los angeles they demand high prices for building things you're never going to stop that the city council will never fight the unions there's all kinds of reasons why uh, the, the the stuff is so expensive but that that really begs the question why don't they rethink this since building new is so expensive why aren't they doing rehab why aren't you seeing david rue and Herb Wesson, and um, you know some of the people on the Plum Committee coming forward with a major rehab bond. Well, I, like I said, I, I think I hate to be cynical, but I think it's because no wealthy developer in the country is interested in rehab, except one guy I know, Bobby Fisher, who has a billion-dollar fund and he's building all over the country and he's renovating, and he won't do business inside the city of L.A. And the mayor invited him to a big speech. And he said something I can't say to you people here, to a huge room of people about why he doesn't do rehab in Los Angeles. So I think our, our thinking needs to be more radical, and we need to change what we think the paradigm is. I hear a few uh, places of agreement. I don't know if you've heard them. One is housing costs too much. Two is it takes too long to build. And, and three is we ought to come up with more creative solutions than just market rate high-rise housing. Hey, yeah, all right, well, so we do agree on those things, that's good. I don't think that means that we're necessarily, obviously, pro-growth or no growth. And to me, that's the moment that we're in, which is we all see the need for more housing. The real question is how we go about doing that. So I'd like to just turn that question back to you both to say, what do you think are the most creative, good solutions that we're seeing in housing today? And uh, Jill, maybe we'll start with you. I think uh, you've said something about rehabbed housing. Uh, let's hear if you've seen any really good models that you would point to of new housing where you say that's the way Los Angeles could go. Of, of building new, you mean? Yeah. I don't know of any right now. I mean, I think all new housing is out of control on the price. Um, I, I don't know of one, but maybe Gary does. Wow. Okay, we got to take Jill on a tour. I think we could just go right back here off the pier, turn left. Uh, there's some uh, housing with affordable units in it that's pretty nice. Well, but is it more than like 10% affordable? Because it's just a, a little drip. Of really excellent point. Uh, yes, not not enough affordable. You might say in any of these uh, market rate housing developments, 10% isn't enough. Uh, Gary, what about you? Well, I think there are I think there are many opportunities that we have in our on our community. Uh, Jill was talking about the fact that you have to go in for a zoning change. And that's true. Because our zoning laws were written 40 years ago. And the goal at that time was to build a suburban community everywhere you could. It was to take an orchard and build a suburban community. Or take a piece of farmland and build a suburban community. And we built a lot of houses just like that. And that's how our zoning rules and regulations were written. They weren't written to build higher density or high rise. And so if you're a landowner and you want to do that and you want to build more housing, you have to go in for a zoning change. You have no option but to go in for a zoning change. Now, I think perhaps one of the things that we'd agree on is that we need to get these 35 community plans that we have in Los Angeles. They need to be redone. And the proposal is to do that in a seven-year period. That is almost impossible to do in a seven-year period. But they've hired a bunch of extra planners to do that. 
and the purpose of and the reason they take a, a long time is not because you have a bunch of planners or architects that come into communities and say you should do this, this, and this. It's because you get input from the community about the, the kinds of plans that they have and the kinds of visions that they have for their community in the future. I think there's a underlying question that we might, and our audience might be interested in as well, which is, uh, the debate usually goes between city agencies and developers. And we have a lot of people in the community who really have something at stake, maybe because of what you said at the very beginning, Gary, that home is really where our hearts are. And so this isn't about anything that we feel is a neutral issue. These are things that really matter to us. What do you think the role of the community should be in thinking about the future housing in their neighborhood? Do you have a, are neighborhood councils working? Should we uh, increase neighborhood participation? Has that been productive? Well, that's one of the reasons that this is such a challenging subject. It's challenging in Los Angeles and it's challenging everywhere because you have a real strong feeling about the place in which you live and you're concerned if something happens to change it. And I understand that. And in your heart or in your head, you might say, I understand we need more housing because our children cannot find a place to live here that they can afford. You understand that. But in your heart, if a mile away they're going to build something that is denser than it is right now, you say, I'm not sure that I want that. And so that, that is kind of the battle that goes on in the hearts and minds of people every single day in every neighborhood. And if we decide we just don't want to build more housing because this is a city that we like just the way it is and we don't want our kids or our grandkids to live here with us, then that's a decision that I guess we, we can make as a community. I think that's the wrong decision for Los Angeles. It would have been the wrong decision when each of us moved to Los Angeles. Well, I, I think that, um, well, they're, they're rewriting the, the community plans, as Gary pointed out. And we, we found it very interesting when they finished up the West Adams community plan about a year ago, year and a half ago, and the West Adams community spent seven years. People took time off of their daily lives. They went at night. They met with the city planning department. And the community, including the neighborhood council system, worked out a new West Adams community plan. And it's kind of a hot area. I mean, there's people moving into West Adams. There's gentrification. And the day that their environmental impact report was approved on all this new zoning, and this is an area that didn't have anything taller than three stories, and they agreed to do seven stories in some of their areas. So they were pro-development and pro-density, much more so than some other areas of the city. The same day their, their EIR was approved, uh, behind closed doors in a different room in City Hall, the City Council agreed to let a developer put a 32-story tower right in the middle of their seven-story development plan. So it was a brand new plan brand new zoning, modern approach, and they still got screwed by a developer, a billionaire in San Francisco. So now there's a lawsuit, very ugly, back and forth, and people don't trust the process. So they know that the community plans are being redone, and they point to a brand new community plan that was meaningless the day the paper was signed. And that's, that's I think, the fundamental problem between the community plans, the neighborhood councils, and the city, which is it's distrust. Who does the city listen to? Does a developer need to build a high-rise, a 32-story luxury building at, at La Cienega and Washington? No, they don't need to. It's right on the Bayona Creek. It's right on the Bayona Creek pa uh, bicycle path. It's a really cool space. They could do all kinds. They could do a transit-oriented village. But that developer lives in a different city, and they, they want more money. So I think you've got... Um, it, it, you have a, a monetary problem, you have people, you have some greed, and you have bad planning, it all comes together. And I, I think that if people, if neighborhood councils and communities were more involved, 
we would have better planning. If more everyday people were involved, we would naturally have smarter decision making. Let's um, turn it over to our audience and listen to their interesting ideas. If anyone has questions, Cami has a microphone. Yes, thanks. Would you Hi. introduce yourself? Yes, certainly. Uh, first off, thank you guys for being here. I've learned a lot in this conversation, and so I think it's really good that we can have this kind of thing. Uh, my name is Luke Phillips. I work for a guy named uh, Joel Kotkin, who I'm sure you all love, appreciate, and agree with on one issue apiece. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's take this out to the state and national levels. Should we look at housing and the housing crisis from a state level and from a national level more in terms of social policy and anti-poverty policy, in terms of what is a social contract and how do we keep people with the American life, or should we look at it in terms of infrastructure strategy, in terms of well, what does the American housing market look like, what does the American economy look like, and how to, can we get people to participate in that? Good question. Uh, and if you keep your responses short, I'd like, do you have an answer for that, Gary? Would you like to begin? That was so complicated. I was going to wait for Gary to answer, and then, and then I would know what, what I think. Like a, um, a big fan of Joel's, and know Joel well, by the way. Um, so, are you saying would you choose to promote the idea of the infrastructure over the idea of the of the? Should you look at it in terms of infrastructure more so in terms of anti-poverty, or the other way around when we're addressing? So, this? I think there's a, okay. One I way see. of thinking of the question is how broad is this problem? Mm -hmm. And what lo level, local to state to national, should we be thinking about it? Or how do each of those contribute? Okay, I see, see what you're saying now. I, you know, I just got back from Seattle. I, I flew up there. I'm from there. I wanted to see the eclipse, the totality, and all that. And um, Seattle built uh, 21,000 units of housing last year. They're on a roar, a rip roar. And it's just every cranes, way more cranes than Los Angeles, if you can imagine that, in a small town between two bodies of water. And um, Rent prices shot up after they built the 21,000. So infrastructure is, 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 let's get back to luxury housing. Is luxury housing infrastructure or is it an investment uh, tool? I, I haven't figured that out yet, but in Seattle, it looks like it's an investment tool because the rents went crazy after they poured in all kinds of new housing. I would go to, if I were gonna do anti-poverty versus infrastructure, I would go to a mix. It's, it's that obviously every West Coast city right now, except maybe Stockton, is very hot, and it's happening all over the West Coast. The things we're talking about in LA are happening in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, and all of those local politicians are making all of the same, what I think, are mistakes. Did you say not Stockton? Because let's go. <laughs> I, think, I think Stockton is still Stockton. Stockton. I think it's still, you know, being rejected, but I don't know for sure. Um, but I, I do think that, I think that, wouldn't it be great if you could get all of these uh, politicians uh, into a room together to commiserate over their individual problems, they realize they're all doing the exact same things and have the exact same problems. Maybe that would get us a couple steps forward, you know? But in public, not behind closed doors. A public, like a public symposium. I don't, I don't know. We have a moment to think, Gary. Thank you. Okay, you're on. Well, housing is a is an infrastructure problem, and it, it it demands infrastructure wherever it's built, whether it's in infill development or whether it's more in the suburbs. And that's one of the reasons that people shied away from building in the suburbs. And Joel is a major proponent of building in the suburbs, and and I know that and. Many people in Los Angeles grew up in the suburbs, and, and I don't see anything wrong with growing up in the suburbs. In fact, uh, I think we have to build more housing there, too. I think we just have to build more housing, period. <laughs> this, this, this region, we just don't have enough housing. You have to live someplace. I, I agree that we can build granny flats. I, I agree that we can refurbish uh, garages and make them into into housing and and do it well. We have to, we have to allow lots of different kinds of housing. We got so used to having 2,500 square foot in a big in a big yard, and that probably is not the housing of the future. Do we have another question? Uh, yes. Okay, then we'll pass it to you next. Hi, good Go evening. Ahead. My name's Jasmine. I'm born and raised from New York. And speaking, I'm not sure 
how much knowledge you have on the New York market, because I know you're representing here on behalf of California, but there's plenty of housing. The problem is there are thousands and thousands of units across Brooklyn currently right now that aren't being filled because the average salary in comparison with the ratio of income from cost of living is not able to match up. And so most people are moving in. I have friends that have about five to 10 roommates in Williamsburg alone. And that Williamsburg is actually a very hot market in Brooklyn. But the issue is the cost. The average for a studio in New York City is 2300 and that's a studio. And they have micro units. Micro units are like less than 250 square feet. And those are about, about 1600. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. So my question is, how is more housing effective here in, in, in comparison to what's happening in New York City? Thanks. Like, uh, it's not so different than here. So uh, Gary, I think that was directed to you specifically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not to put a fine point on that. <laughs> what happens when you build more, when you build more housing, you have more housing available, the price of the units that are older doesn't escalate so much. We, we have such a shortage of housing here that the price of the older houses that were built long ago that are much less expensive, they go up at the same rate. Typically, that's not always been, been the way. It's been newer housing typically costs more and older housing was less expensive. And I don't know about you, when I bought my first house, that was a long time ago, and it was an old house in an older neighborhood, and it cost $19,000. Now, it wasn't in California, but that's what happens. But when you have such a shortage of demand or of supply, the older housing goes up way too fast. And I don't know whether you were talking about young, uh, newer housing units. Newer housing. Even the ones that are being remodeled are being called luxury. Everything's being tied luxury. There's not enough affordable housing. Right. right. So almost everything that's going up, yes. like skyscrapers, there's yes. hundreds yes. of them going up. Even filtered like down it, now seems. I mean, the it theory. It is not of, a unique challenge to us here. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that you're pointing at a problem that, as uh, was just said, it's in all cities now, which is the filter down model that Gary's describing isn't effective at the moment because the lowest end isn't low enough for entry level housing, which makes you think that we're going to have to go to some other solutions, whether it's rent control or rent subsidies or something other than production alone. And I think both uh, people here are imagining that it's a multiple solution. There's no single bullet that's going to work in these things. But I think the kind of problem you're talking about is an indication that supply isn't enough. Um, I want to just go to the question that was here. I'm sorry, Jill. Uh, did, yeah. Call me if you can pass that. Thank you. Hi, my name's Saruchi and I work for a charter school network. A challenge that we've been facing in education is that our schools are racially and socioeconomically segregated because the neighborhoods where our students come from are segregated. So I was wondering if you have any ideas or thoughts on how we can better integrate housing across socioeconomic and racial lines. Great question. We did let Gary off the hook when Jill popped in uh, on the first response. This is a tough question. I'll let either of you respond first. It's it's not a tough question for me because right. I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know either. I As a journalist, I wrote a lot about this topic. In fact, I, I've written a ton about charters, the charter school reform movement, and I've written a ton about um, uh, inequity in Los Angeles. I covered poverty for a couple of years for the LA Times. Um, I think that the, the, it, to me one of the ways that you mix a city together is you, you, you sort of, I think it's a, a time issue. You grow used to each other and then you see these communities like Koreatown which is really 45% Latino and 20% Korean and the rest, whatever, that is called Koreatown, and you end up with, you start to end up with these really interesting patchwork communities. Um, I live, I've lived in about five different places in the San Fernando Valley, and in every one of those I was amazed by the number of people from the Middle East, 
um, people from Asia, Latinos, because I thought the valley was all white, but the valley is one of, the, there's 1.7 million people in the valley. It's one of the most um, diverse bodies of humans on the face of the earth, as per the US Census. It's unbelievably diverse. Uh, they, they're in pockets, like you, you say, but less and less. So I think as the city, uh, as the city matures, and as you see people intermarrying more and more, it's just become completely normal. I think it's, it's the next generation is going to see a, a groundswell of mixed people all over the city, which is good, can only be good for Los Angeles. I would only add to that that neighborhoods uh, have been segregated in Los Angeles for far too long. And we're also watching the artifact of that being exaggerated by housing prices. So. Uh, stabilizing neighborhoods alone isn't enough because that means segregated neighborhoods stay segregated unless we build in a much more diverse housing stock meaning price value we aren't going to get at least economic diversity which sadly to today still equates with racial diversity um, we, we aren't going to be able to achieve that kind of more integrated neighborhood without that kind of housing I should have said thanks for being a teacher <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Sure. Hi, my name is Neil. I did take the train here today. Yay! Um, my, my question is, I live in the Palms area, and we'll see a lot of, um, of, of buildings that are on rent control. Let's say that there's a six-unit um, uh, space that goes away. So we lose six rent-controlled units, and a building will go in that's 30 units, and 10% of those are supposed to be affordable. So I get three affordable units in a space that used to have six and when I say affordable that's still more expensive than the six units that were there before why aren't we seeing any kind of push to at least have a one-to-one -one replacement so we, the new development that goes in at least has the six that were replaced why don't we see that as a push in legislation here in the city I think that's an interesting piece of legislation well I don't know a developer in existence who would say that they would be willing to build a building that is 50% affordable, except for the nonprofits, and they—they're not efficient either. I mean, they're like I said, they're spending between 300,000 and 450,000 to build a unit for a homeless person. So there are—I mean, nobody has figured out how to reduce the cost of housing. The, I think land speculation is a huge problem. I think they're driving up, they're flipping the land. People get. Uh, they get their deal from the city council, their bigger building deal. They don't build the building. They sell the land with the deal. It goes with the deal. And that unit, that thing you were talking about, the 30 units that only have three affordable units, that person who gets that deal, that zone change from the city council, they sell the land. Some of them sell the land without building a thing. They're not trying to build housing. They're just flipping the land. It's, it's really gotten so twisted. I don't know how you turn back time on that kind of thing. But right now, I don't know of anybody willing to build more than 20% affordable housing without practically holding a gun to their head. It's just, it's, they're not going to do it. There's an energetic response here that I'd just That's like to open up. Kathy lives in Santa Monica. Owned a condo, now I rent. Wait, hold on. Here okay. comes a mic. Hi, I'm Kathy. Live in Santa Monica. Owned a condo for many years. Sold it off, and now I'm renting. Kind of expensive, but less what money that over here at the train those were even more money really tiny but besides that flipping has been the thing in my mind the whole time a higher tax on flipping or not allowed to flip for 10 years you know moratorium limits on flipping we need some new creative policy makers in the you know generations of techies that are coming along Besides inventing apps and uh, new things we don't need necessarily, we need someone to start to invent the kinds of policies like you're talking about, I think, that would begin to address some of these issues from a different perspective. I think we have heard a pretty civil and interesting conversation tonight. I have a feeling, thanks to both our guests, I have a feeling there's many more interesting positions in the audience, and I really appreciate all the questions that were here, and thanks again to Pro Con for this wonderful evening. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Closing arguments. Just sum it up. <laughs> um, we started with Gary. 
So I think it would make sense. You choose what you'd prefer, Jill. Would you like to go I'll first? Go ahead. Said, okay, go good. Ahead. My my approach would be if I if somebody made me God for a couple of days, I would just take the people in this room. I would put you on the city council and the metro board, and have you start from scratch with your interesting thoughts and ideas and diversity, and you would do a smart, intelligent, humane thing, and you wouldn't be stuck in a rut like our current government systems are doing the same things again and again that don't work. You in this group know more and see more than elected officials. I don't mean to be too cynical, but this is what I've learned over the years in journalism, and I learned, I learned it even more as an advocate since I left journalism. So congratulations to all of you because you could run the show. Gary, it's going to be hard to top that. <laughs> well, I, I want to congratulate the voters of Los Angeles who last year, by a 70% to 30% margin, said no to what Jill is proposing. Said no to a moratorium on housing. And Jill had a proponent on her side that spent five and a half million dollars to get that passed and still could only get 30% of the vote. So we do have some smart people in Los Angeles, and they understand the value and importance of housing. Well, there you go. That was a kind of final undercut from the nice guy. Uh, <laughs> look, um, <laughs> I think probably, Jill, you've had far worse. I know you can take it. You're a pretty tough cookie. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Kami. Yeah, th and thank you, thank you to our moderator. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Dana. What a terrific display of civil discourse. Uh, folks, just so you know, we're here in Santa Monica witnessing this, but this is being uh, live streamed on Facebook. This is being video recorded. We're going to show this to the whole nation. This is what civil discourse looks like. Thank you so much for that. It's so interesting. Thanks, everybody. This is the last of our series for this year. So for those of you who have come every week, thank you so much for doing it. You braved a monster movie that was being filmed on the pier earlier tonight. So thank you for braving the monster to be here. Uh, we're going to miss you until next year, where hopefully we get a chance to do this again. I hope you do keep an eye on ProCon.org and keep an eye on the USC Unruh Institute. Keep an eye on the Santa Monica Pier to see if you can watch this again. If you do take pictures from tonight, remember hashtag civil discourse. If you want to watch a video of what happened tonight, you can see it on ProCon.org or on our Facebook feed. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to vote or collect some of the free swag, please do it before you, you head on out. But folks, thank you for a great series and have a good evening. Thank you.